Delta equals epsilon over three. Okay. I will show or state your thesis. I will prove that if x minus two is less than delta, you might rephrase that in your head as the x is within delta of two, then it must follow that f of x minus five is less than epsilon, or the function will we get within some arbitrary epsilon of five. All right, what do I, what part do I start with for my assumption that x minus two is less than delta? Yes, I show that when that is a starting point, it must follow that this happens. Well, I just said delta is epsilon over three. How do I get to f of x? What do I do next? Multiply both sides by three. Uh, can I multiply three into the absolute value? Would the result be the same? Yes. yes. All right. And how do I get f of x when I have a negative six there, not a negative one or five? Split it up into minus one, minus five. I think we can all agree that negative six is negative one minus five. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is f of x. All righty then. Now this one, that one's fine, but this, this is so cool. You're going to love this because, first of all, it makes you feel smart. And who doesn't want to feel smart? Right? So, check this out. Um, proving the limit of a nonlinear function at a positive value. I don't know if we'll do negatives. Negatives are quite a bit harder, but we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll see how it goes with positives, I guess. All right, so uh, you'll find that you're going to do a little bit of a two-step, all right? Uh, that'll make sense in a second. You're going to need some scotch paper eventually. Not today. You're going to do all your work on this paper. But when you do these problems on the homework, it'll be kind of like writing your essay in college, though. Because I, I'm not going to read your outline. I don't want to read your notes. I don't want to read your rough stuff. I don't want to read any of that stuff. I want the final product, and that's it. Okay. That'll be what you're doing here. You're gonna be giving the final product and you'll have to do some scratch work off to the side. But the good news is, when you just read the proof and don't see the scratch work, you're gonna look like, oh, you're gonna look brilliant. It's, it's so cool, you're gonna look brilliant. All right, so here's the process. This is what we're trying to prove, you follow? We must find delta first. And that's where the scratch work comes in. <clears throat> to get the delta, you're going to start with x squared minus 9 has to eventually end at less than delta. So where do I have to start at? Well, let's go there. How do I get from here to here? Oops. Because if I could get from there to there, well, then that's my delta. This is delta. That's what I'm looking for. When I get x minus 3 by itself, what's on the other side? Right? That's where I'm headed. How do you get from x squared minus 9 to x minus 6? What could you do? Step by fraction. And I'm going to throw it in absolute value separate, which is fine. Um, yeah. I want to isolate x minus 3. So I'm going to divide over x plus 3. Cool. And I'm tempting to say that's my delta. Is this delta? No. It is not. Delta is a function of epsilon only and numbers, not x. And a number, not x. All right, so here's the deal. This, then, to get a number here in place of an x, we're going to have to start off with a little bit of an assumption. It is 100% allowed. Don't worry. It's all good. Um, we want a numerical form. Well, let's start here. If we're looking at what happens as x approaches 3, then we can assume that x is close to 3. The whole problem is, what's the limit as x approaches 3? So let's go with the assumption that we're around 3. Do you follow? 
the typical assumption is within one unit. So if we're around three, then let's go with the assumption that we're between two. One unit on either side of three. Let's just, again, what the whole idea is a limited x goes to three. So let's just go with the assumption that we're within one of three on either side. Now, what would that mean for x plus three? So if I add three to each of those, is that mathematically okay? Is the inequality still true? As true as it was? True. Right? Um, so that means x plus 3 has to be between 5 and 7. Yay. Uh, is between 5 and 7 positive? Um, does putting absolute value on a number that's already positive hurt it? So I can do that. All right, now a little bit of math rules here. Um, a little bit of math rules that you might need once in a while on these problems. Do you agree that two is less than three is less than four? Now, what I'm getting at is here is this. The x plus three I want to talk about is actually not in the numerator, it's in the denominator. Mm -hmm. Anyone got that far? Chris, you're still fine. Oh, you're still fine. Yeah. All right, um, so here's the deal. I want to, instead of fencing in x plus 3, I want to fence in denominator x plus 3. So that's what I'm getting at here. Um, 2 is less than 3 is less than 4. What happens when I take reciprocals? Is 1 half less than 1 third, less than 1 fourth, or do the inequalities switch directions? Switch directions. Now that's partially why names are special causes, because maybe they just put it in this way. But, uh, or if there's any true causes in there. But that's true. We know that to be true. Now, because of that, that implies then that this would be the same as one-fifth is greater than one over absolute value of x plus three is greater than one over seven. And because epsilon is always positive, it's always positive, when I say, hey, show me the limit within a 10, you don't care about, you know, about sine positive or negative sine positive. You assume epsilon is always positive. That means that I can multiply through by an epsilon. But all right. Now, if I look back at what I wanted to fence in, remember way back here, I wanted to talk about what epsilon over x plus 3 is, but in a numerical kind of fashion. You follow me? This will tell me what to choose for the delta. For delta, choose the least. And that's epsilon. You're going to choose the lesser of the whole bunch. In this case, that's epsilon over 7. I'll show you why that helps in a second. Let's get that. Are you cool? That's all the scratch work you do in finding delta. Now, I will say this. I'm teaching here. If I do this problem on my paper, my scratch work is nowhere near all this. Write yourself a note. Um, all this work is for notes only. Scratch work can skip as many steps as you like. It's for your benefit only. I will not see it. You will not turn it in with the homework. You will not do it on the test. I will give you, every time you take one of these on a test, I'll give you some scratch work. I don't want to see your scratch work. I don't care. I want to see your final paper. All right. So here goes the proof. Now, the proof is the final graph. It's got to be good. It's got to be thorough. It's got to leave no stone unturned. So here we go. A proof, just like yesterday, starts with identifying the delta that will make the definition clear. If we choose a delta, it is... Epsilon over, I forgot what I said, epsilon over 7? I will show that if x minus, am I approaching? I don't even know what I'm approaching anymore. 9? 3? x minus 3 is less than delta, then it must follow that f of x minus 9 will end up less than epsilon. Okay, now, put yourself in the shoes of the reader. They will not see all this. They're starting with 
that delta equal epsilon over 7. You can imagine the confusion if you don't explain things. Well, epsilon over 7, what? I didn't see it. Where did that 7 come from? What are you talking about? It's in 7. You've got to communicate that well. So here's where it goes, like this. You start by assuming x minus 3 is less than delta, right? Now, based on the delta that I just set, x minus 3 must therefore be less than epsilon over 7. Now, here's where we take what's called a corollary. We go off to the side and make a little side note, side proof, okay? Footnote, if you like. Go off to the side. And now you're going to show them, let me show you where this epsilon over 7 is coming from. You start with communicating your assumption that x is close to 3, which is between 2 and 4. That is not a leap. That is not, you know, some huge, that's common. If nobody's going to have a problem with that. It's, that's how it's done. You assume because it's a limit, we're close to 3. So cool. And you go about the building up how you get 7. Um, in essence, you're really trying to get that x plus 3 that eventually will get you back to f of x. So the first thing we're going to want to do is bring in a 3. You don't have to show plus 3 on each side. You can say x plus 3 is less than 7. And anybody, you can you can kind of assume that somebody reading this is half their intelligence, so they're going to know what to do, okay? That might be a reason I'm just showing it. Do you understand? Uh, you're, you're going to need the absolute value on there because you're going to bring that x plus 3 back over and inequalities, you need to make sure it's positive so you don't have to switch the sign. So now you want to say, okay, throw in some absolute value. And again, nobody's going to have a problem with that because it's positive. You just put absolute value on a positive number anyway. It's fine. They might say, why are you doing that? But it's, it's not breaking math. Are you cool? Then we try to get some denominators. One fifth is, and this again is going with the assumption that somebody is fairly mathy, so they know that when you take reciprocals, the inequality shifts. All right. Finally, we're multiplying through by an epsilon. Then that's allowed. It is also understood that epsilon is positive. You don't have to set it back. All right. You follow me? Now when, you, now, when you get to the proof here, you're going to see why I chose epsilon over 7 and not why not epsilon over 5. Why I chose that one. Yes? Um, in that second step, when you just put things in front of it, can you say it's close to actual positive? Uh, I, I think that's a good question. Somebody asked me that in the last class, and I think that's a little bit too much at once. But asking somebody to say, wait a second, what did they do here? They looked like they added 3, and they got absolute value. Two things at once doesn't believe too much. Okay, unless it's really obvious. Um, so I, th I think it should be simple. Okay? Now, here is where we go with a little bit of logic. We left off, if you remember where we left off, we left off at the point that x minus 3 is less than epsilon over 7. But we just show that epsilon over 7 is less than... Yeah, isn't epsilon over 7 less than epsilon over x plus 3? Do you agree? All right, now, I'll finish the proof in a second, but pause here. What if I had chosen, if I had chosen epsilon over 5, then where would I be? I would say x minus 3 is less than epsilon over 5, but then what do I do with that? I know that x minus 3 is less than epsilon over 5, and this is less than epsilon over 5, but they're both less than epsilon over 5. I don't know how they relate to each other, you know what I mean? So you, that's why you choose epsilon over 7, because you get this definite A is less than B is less than C kind of situation. Now that's called the trichotomy rule. If A is less than B is less than C, then you know A is less than C. It must be that x minus 3 is less than epsilon over absolute value of x plus 3. In other words, the epsilon over 7 did its work. We used it. It did beautifully. But now we want to get to the x's to get back to the point. So now, we're going to move over to x plus 3, which I don't have to switch the inequality because the absolute value is definitely guaranteeing it's positive. 
So multiply that and get x squared minus 9 in the absolute values. And hey, looky there. That is alpha x. Now, um, again, I'm just showing every little thing. And if you get good at this, the scratch work, it, it'll be less and less, and it'll go very quickly. The proof needs to be perfect. The proof should always be rigorous, but the scratch work is where you can perfect. Um, here's this one as well. And those of you who are catching on, fine. Go with it. If you're not catching on, fine. And you don't know what the heck is going on, well, then welcome to my shoes. Sure, most of you seem like you're rolling, so cool, but if you're not sure how to get started, this is what you're trying to do. What's your strategy? Again, I, I feel free to cut corners on your scratch work, but the proof is just 
The arrows, the arrows uh, help communicate when you're breaking off to the coral area and what step you're coming back to in your cruise. So at least one arrow is good when you go to the assumption, but either one coming back is also helpful. Uh, you just got done, and then can we go over it real quick or at least see what you got here? Uh, after I write mine up there, you can say, what if I did this, or what if mine looks like that? I'm happy to tell you, no, I need to see that step, or no, I need to that. Uh, as far as the scratch work, I'll never see it. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how much work you do. Uh, if you can go straight from there to there, great, good for you. I, that's fine with me. I'm, I'm kind of in between. I have to show a little bit, but before I do it. But, uh, now the proof is you clearly identify delta and your thesis. If x minus 2 is within delta, then let's follow the delta. Y is within epsilon of the limit. <coughs> All righty. So you stated your hypothesis. You identified your epsilon over 6. And now this is where I am excited to see where you're coming from with this epsilon over 6. If you assume x is close to, in this case, x is between 1 and 3, and therefore if we, am I trying to get x minus 2 or am I trying to get x minus x plus 3 here? I'm trying to do x plus 3 here. I don't think anybody will have a problem with that. I don't think anybody will have a problem with some absolute value on an already positive number. Uh, let's assume they understand the rule of flipping fractions and epsilon is positive, and that's okay to do to all three terms. And then, back to my proof I go, I left off seeing x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 6. I haven't changed anything there. That's the correct thing from there. But based on this, it also must be less than epsilon over x plus 3 absolute value. Then you should show, all right, I don't need that middleman, a less than b, less than c, implies a less than c. Multiply over with the absolute value. If you don't have the absolute value, your whole proof falls apart. And x squared minus 6, uh, no, plus x minus 6 is also bad. Are you with me? How'd it go? Okay, now. Those were both problems, so, so they were pretty much the same. Not everything is that way. So you also have to deal with other curves, lots of curves. So this one again, so many curves. We're just getting started. All righty then. <coughs> Prove the limit as x goes to 4 of 1 over x is 1 4. The algebra will be a little different. The delta will be a little different. What should we start with aside for our scratch work? Start with the, with what? How do I get my delta? Uh, not yet. The scratch work starts with f minus l. Start with 1 over x minus 1 fourth less than epsilon and try and figure out how do I get to x minus 4 less than something and that's going to be the delta, right? You define the delta through scratch work. And that goes from function backwards. So how do I get from that thing to x minus 4? What's algebra like? Common denominator. Common denominator. Okay, I like it. So 4 minus x over 4x is less than epsilon. We? All right. We're getting there. Looking good. Now what? 
Take out the four x. Can I split it up and multiply it? Right? Well, no, no, no. Can I? Let's do this again. I will. I would eventually skip steps, but for no purposes on the book. Do you agree that the quotient, absolute value of a quotient, is the same as the quotient of two separate absolute values? So the quotient would follow. Okay. Um, what about the four minus x not being x minus four? Is that a problem? Subtraction order matters unless. There's absolute value. So does that matter? Is 4 minus x an absolute value the same as x minus 4? Yeah. And do you mind if I also move over the absolute value of 4x? Okay. Now this is where our delta is going to come from. This will be delta, but we want a numerical form of this. Remember, delta isn't an x-based form. It's an epsilon and number-based form. So we want to make this numerical. How do I... Which x is for numerical value? That's where you make the assumption. Assume x is between 3 and 5. So what about 4x? Multiply through by 4. So 4x is between 12 and 20, yeah? What about epsilon of 4x? Isn't epsilon of 4x the same as epsilon times 12, epsilon times 4x, and I'm throwing some absolute value, and epsilon times 20? So what should we choose for our delta? Let delta equal 12 epsilon or 20 epsilon? 12. 12, okay. 12 epsilon, you choose the lesser. So delta is 12 epsilon, and here we go with our proof. Identify your delta. Let delta equal... 12 epsilon. I will prove, satisfying the definition, that if x minus 4 is less than delta, then it must follow that f of x minus the limit, which in this case is 1 fourth, is less than epsilon. What do we assume or get us going with? x minus 4 must be less than Delta, and therefore x minus 4 must be less than 12 epsilon. Right? Now what do we do? We go off to the side and explain 12 epsilon for the reason. How do I start with the explanation? Now assume x is between 3 and 5, and then we build up. So what's the next thing we build up? 12 is less than 4, x is less than 5, and, or 20 rather, excuse me. And doesn't that mean that the absolute value is between 12 and 20? We? Okay, and then what else do we need? There's one more thing we need. Epsilon. 12 epsilon is less than the absolute value of 4x, epsilon is less than 20. Epsilon. Well, with that, combined with my previous step, we knew that x minus 4 had to be less than 12 epsilon. But I just established 12 epsilon is also less than 10. Absolute value of 4x epsilon. And the trichotomy is if a is less than b is less than c, then a is less than c. So x minus 4 must be less than Absolute value of 4x epsilon. Dump the middleman. Relating the x's directly. And then here's where we're going to have to be clear where the algebra comes from. Because getting back to that statement requires a lot of tweaking our function. So uh, we can divide both sides by 4x. I think we all know that's cool. Uh, you could do this in several orders. But uh, tell me, what would you do next? Put it in a single? Put it in one single absolute value. Drop the ball now. Be thorough. Don't skip steps. Just scream. Trying to get through it quickly. Do it well. And now what else do I have to do? Split it right here. Okay. If we split it, I don't think anybody would have a hard time seeing that you just split the fraction in two, which is fine. And then, what's the problem with that? It's opposite. Is that the same as that? It is. And 
Zero four. Oh, so that one. We got to this one. You down? Yeah. Okay. Last ugly one you might see is something like one is more than x. Uh, I'll let you get started here. Once you run into a brick wall, then I'll get you running into a brick wall. Here. And some of you are a little rusty in the old difference of cubes, yeah? What is it? X minus 2? Point, you eventually get x minus 2 has to be less than epsilon over x squared plus 2x plus 4 is absolutely that. Yeah? And we want a numerical form of that. This is our delta, but uh, we need to make it numerical. So what shall I start with? X is between 1 and 3. All right, now we want to build up a numerical form of this. Now because there's two x's, we have to show this a couple different steps. I think you'll agree that as far as x squared, if x is between 1 and 3, then x squared should be between 1 and 9. Likewise, 2x, if x is between 1 and 3, then 2x should be between 2 and 6. Therefore, shouldn't x squared plus 2x be between three and fifteen. <laughs> X squared plus two X should be between three and fifteen. If I add those two truths, I get a third truth. Are you down? Now what else do I need in there? Four. So seven is less than X squared plus two X plus four is less than nineteen. Yes. I agree. Is it uh, is it easy to follow correctly? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I, I you are absolutely right. I forgot. I you're absolutely right. Go for it. Definitely, you're right. Hundred um, percent. Am I there or am I not there? I still need to take. Reciprocals. So 1 7, 1 over x squared plus 2x plus 4. I'll need some absolute value in my final proof. And 1 19. So do I go with the 19 or the 7? 19. Your delta is what? If I slap a delta, slap, or an epsilon, slap an epsilon, the delta is? Epsilon over 19. That's your epsilon, or your delta. Okay? So, if you let delta equal epsilon over 19, you look brilliant because nobody sees your scratch work and they're thinking, oh, this guy is crazy with this epsilon over 19. If x minus 2 is less than delta, I will show by that delta that it must be the case f of x minus 9 is less than epsilon. All right. Alright, now let me show you something, something like this. If x minus 2 is less than delta, then x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 19. Now, epsilon over 19, where's that coming from? Well, if we go with the assumption that x is close to 2, so let's say between 1 and 3, 
and I need to eventually build up this big old mess. So that's why I'm going to look over here, peek up my notes. That means x squared is between 1 and 9, and 2x is between 2 and 6. And so by adding those two things, I would get x squared plus 2x is between 3 and 16. Um, if I add 4 to both sides, and I see my 19 here, then I show the reciprocal of component 1 7 is greater than 1. Well, actually, maybe I should throw the absolute value in there. Put the absolute value in first. It's more likely to be if I put it in with something else. So then 1 7 is greater than 1 over. All right, and therefore that's done. So much for moving. Now I'm ready to go back and finish my proof up stuff. X minus 2 is less than epsilon over 19, and I just demonstrated that epsilon over 19 has to be less than epsilon over the absolute value of x squared plus 2x plus 4 for x is close to 2. And so, x minus 2 must be less than epsilon over x squared plus 2x plus 4. x plus 3. Uh, x cubed. What did you expect? This is x cubed minus 8, right? Mm -hmm. And x cubed minus 8 is the same as, or 8 is, negative 8 is the same as, plus 1 minus 9. That is f of x. Go ahead, demonstrate. Boom. All righty then. Wow. So do you feel smart? Yes. You should, because how many people can do this question? I've taught a lot of people this, and some people can wrap their mind around it, and some people. Okay. So, be grateful for your amazing brains. Um, questions on 102. Oh, yeah. We're going to the test today or tomorrow. Uh, sure. Except I don't have the people that graded theirs yesterday. So they took theirs yesterday too. So sorry, you people.
So, in terms of the grading scale for the first set, uh, the first set of the second set, so, for page two, So for page two, the highest score was a 21 out of 25. This is page two. 19 was four. 18 was one, two, three. One, two, 17. 16 is... I'm taking the time to do this is so I don't hear a bunch of complaints from parents saying I ripped you off, the test was too long, I scaled it very generously. Um, okay, so the way I scaled it was basically I looked for peaks and this to me was the logical place draw the A. If you got 17 or above, you got an A. Uh, if you were 12 and above, that's a B. Although 12 is not even half correct, you got a B. Uh, the test was just wrong. That's all I should do. my fault. Uh, down to 7, 8 was a C, and below 8 was a C. All right, so the point is that I want to make is I scaled it accordingly. Yes, it was too long. I know that frustrates me, uh, but that's my fault and I did. All right, um, we'll go over that more tomorrow, or at all tomorrow. <laughs> Let's talk, getting those back and then going over row two. Ten questions, or no questions. No questions on row two? No questions on row two, you did it. Question on one two, maybe I can do one or two. We'll probably have to finish tomorrow. One or two. Four? Four. Four, okay. Four. Let's see if I can at least get this right. Is that book or the place? Uh, kind of book, but kind of I give you a note. Okay, I'm with you. So it's pretty Rusty, I imagine you're infinite Riemann sum knowledge. Am I right? Huh? So you're pointing oh, here okay. under y equal two x plus one. I'm gonna call this f for the reason that the venue function notation on zero to three. Let's start with this big idea: the area is the sum of many rectangles. Then go more specific. Base is delta x. The height is the function at different x's. That to me is the big idea on Riemann sums. Then the details. What's delta x for this problem? Three over, three over n. Okay, you're taking the region that's three wide and breaking it into some number of chunks. Now, the x at which you draw depends on many things. Does the region start at zero? Is it right or left? Um, what's the delta? But I think. But if we're using right-hand rectangles, we start at zero and go one delta over. Isn't the first f just a single three over n? And the x, the next x at which I'll draw a height is two three over n's. And the third x at which I'll draw a height is the third three over n. So the x at which I draw heights is just some 
the number of delta x's I've gone over to get to that point. You follow me? Now, if I'm using right, then I will start by going over one delta. So I start at one. And if there are n rectangles, then it ends at n. I know you want to get infinity in there. It comes from the limit later. Here we go so far. All right. Now you go function specific. The function is 2 blank plus 1. And in that blank goes the individual x's, which we said come from some multiples of delta x, right? All right. Now, if we want to know what all this adds to, then really we always only need to focus on the when i is 1, the i is 2, and so on. All the other stuff would be <coughs> common factor. When i is 1, I'll have a 3 and a 2 and a 3 x. When i is 2, I have a 3 and a 2 and a 3 x. All that stuff will be common. So I'm going to split this and take out common factors. This guy will always have a 3 n, a 2, and another 3 over n. And then you'll just be summing lots of different numbers. Are you with me on that? This guy, you'll have 3 over n every time the counter counts. So you have 3 over n once and 3 over n twice. All together then, you're just going to do a whole bunch of 3 over n's. You could pull the 3 over n out here or just say this is 3 over n over so many times. Do you follow me? Are you following me or am I going too fast? Okay. Now, this uh, is 18 over n squared. This is where the formula comes in. Uh, we'll finish tomorrow. You can keep it. Uh, tomorrow we'll do kind of a extra price and stuff. Because then we're going to take it through.